Welcome to On Directing, a conversation with award-winning director Francois Girard and the Metropolitan Opera's dramaturge, Paul Cremo, on directing for cinema, opera, and theater. I'm Jessica London, the executive director of the Council for Canadian American Relations, and I'm pleased to be partnering on this fourth program in our series, Cross-Border Currents, with the National Arts Club in New York. The program series explores artists and their work based on collaborations, artistic exchanges, and cultural events in Canada and the United States. CCAR facilitates cross-border friendship and impact through the arts. Please visit us to learn more at ccar-nyc.org or visit us on Instagram. The National Arts Club is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a ma mandate to foster, stimulate, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To learn more, visit nationalartsclub.org or visit them on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We're grateful to our program partners, Embassy of Canada, the Consulate General of Canada in New York, the Quebec Government Office in New York, and the Metropolitan Opera. François Girard was born in 1963 in Quebec. His, he is renowned as much for his filmmaking as he is for his staging of opera and theater. His productions include 32 short films about Glenn Gould, The Red Violin, Cirque du Soleil's Zed and Zircana, the Metropolitan Opera's Parsifal, The Flying Dutchman, and Lohengrin. His play The Hunting Gun is currently running at the Baryshnikov Art Center in New York, and his forthcoming film will be Portrait of the Mind. Paul Cremo is the dramaturge and director of opera commissioning program at the Metropolitan Opera. He has supervised development on new operas including Nico Muli's Marnie, Matthew O'Coin's Eurydice, Ricky Ian Gordon's Intimate Apparel, and Kevin Putz's The Hours. He was formerly an artist and repertoire executive for Sony Classical Sony Masterworks, and has served as a member of the Pulitzer Prize Music Jury and the Tony Awards nominating panel. Without further ado, I turn today's conversation over to Paul Cremo and François Girard. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jessica. And hello, François. Good to see you. Good to see we, you again. Yes, we've been spending some time together. It's been a pleasure and a joy, as always, to have you here at the Met for the last several weeks as you created your production of Lohengrin and mounted it here at the Met and uh, at your, your third opera at the Met. So I think you've gotten the ropes here, but we also have the history going back to, uh, as Jessica mentioned, I was a soundtracks exec executive at Sony Classical. Several years ago, we went, we met first over 25 years ago when we worked together on the soundtrack for the Red Violin, now having its 25th anniversary, amazingly. So it's great to, to have this long running relationship. Something to celebrate. And then, yes, yes, like uh, it's, um, and uh, like what ties us is also our friendship with, and collaboration with Peter Gelb, uh, who's been a, um, a great supporter, uh, even back with 32 short films about Glenn Gould, because th this is how I actually got to meet you and Peter, because to, uh, the Glenn Gould movie was a, uh, Glenn Gould was a CBS artist and therefore, uh, became a Sony um, um, artist, and then uh, when I did that film, like we had to uh, collaborate with Sony, and then that was the be beginning of what you described as a twenty-five years collaboration. Mm. Yes, I remember how excited we were when thirty-two short films came onto our radar, and what a singular vision you displayed in the film, and how how just how thrilling it was to see someone making a film who could understand how the importance of music and how music and, and film could work together to create something that's sort of greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, 
the has music always been so central in in your life? Well, I I, I guess I should um, uh, admit that uh, there's a uh, failed musician in me somehow. Um, yeah, my music was always part was always around, uh, and I've always played music as a dilettante. Uh, and I think I grew pretty young. Um, I grew to trust music better than uh, any other language. Um, and uh, as I, I developed my um, work as a director, like music, you know, as most directors will say the same thing, like music is a very powerful vehicle for uh, emotions and, and narrative uh, elements. Uh, and but I think over the years, like I really um, 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 got to develop that, and and uh, opera work came to enrich that, and then uh, making all sort of relations also between opera and film. At first, my uh, appearance on the opera scene with uh, Stravinsky could have seemed quite accidental. It was an offer that I got, and I accepted it. But as I continue to direct operas like I'm, I'm you know the the links and connections between opera and film became manifest in all sort of ways like we can say that cinema and film is born out of opera uh, the 19th century Hollywood was the uh, Italian operatic scene and then there's all sort of like uh, there's a real continuum uh, beyond the, the just the music level there's a real continuum there. So I guess that the um, I ended up making sense of all those various experiences. Were you in a, were you growing up in a family that was uh, particularly musical or artistic? Were there you know, were you encouraged in those forms? Yes, I, I mean my parents are liberals that like valued education. So there's there was all all of it was available to us. My parents were not art artists were not artistic but they were good readers and uh, big uh, um, supporters of culture and I had my sister Sylvie who played piano like non-stop for forever and I was younger six years on, younger than her and I would just play Lego next to the piano and I guess that was my first um, training hearing Bach and uh, Mendelssohn and uh, you know like the piano Panier repertoire of young students. And I played myself as a um, self taught dilettante and became a closet pianist somehow <laughs> and always had a piano with me. Like, and now I have a really good one. But um, uh, that's nothing public. But this, of course, like uh, uh, informed my, my work as a director, yes. So certainly the music has uh, been central to many of the projects in whatever medium you've embraced over the years, but also uh, theater and literature. And I think about uh, some of the plays, the classic plays uh, you've directed, um, you know, Waiting for Godot, um, The Trial, um, novels you've adapted like the, like Silk um, and uh, the, what's your new piece, which we should talk about, The Hunting Gun. So the literature and theater have also in, informed a lot of the work that you've done. Yeah, but all these mediums connect. Like uh, Wagner used uh, the word, created the uh, the concept of art total. I think cinema is also born of that. Like the where you find in opera and cinema, the convergence of all mediums that you just described. So you know, if I had, if I was asked to design a film school, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't teach film. I would teach. Um, I would get the students to learn literature painting, music, and all of those uh, mediums that create l'art total. Today's art total is uh, in some ways like the most vibrant one, the most living one is the uh, cinema. But I think this notion to of converging various languages into one event, one experience uh, is an old dream. Uh, carried by the uh, opera composers as well as like uh, today's filmmakers. So I find the more I go and the more I juggle with both and all of those aspects, uh, the more connections I make and the more sense it makes. And mm -hmm. it's less, less accidental. Yes. 
Um, the, I, I'm still I'm going back to your thinking about your your experience just as a, someone born in Quebec and growing up in Canada. Um, how important has that identity or what's been available to you as a Canadian in terms of your collaborators here, whether it's an actor like Colm Fior or a composer like Howard Shore, how, how important has the Canadian experience been to your work? Well, there's a few things to say. Like when I began, when I began, like I, I in Quebec making movies, the uh, the scene was pretty saturated for my generation because of uh, the the New Yorkan of this world and uh, the producers and and uh, distributors and writers and of that generation created the Quebec author milieu author uh, um, industry and. Uh, there was little room for people of my generation. And then I met with Nee Fitchman, a Toronto-based producer. And we happened to uh, form a friendship and a collaboration that was to be uh, productive in many ways. And one thing we might say is that, like, up on, I think up until 32 short films, there's very, very few, if none, no example of successful collaboration between um, Quebec and English Canada. And I'm saying this with all, like, you know, um, um, although today things have changed, and I think we're way more intermixed and uh, intertwined, but the, uh, strangely enough, especially when it comes to culture and to cinema, th there was a really, like, a, a very tight separation between both milieu. And to jump the fence, like, I, in the end, like, I, I ended up being part of that generation that was creating, like, a, a little, a few decades after Quebec, in um, in Toronto, at least, uh, the Atom Egoyans and Petra Shorozema and Don McKellar of this world became my real colleagues, my my film family. So I I I'm like I think probably one of the rare example and need too like of of breaking that border, breaking that separation. In and I think that was highly informative because. It brought me, um, I remember being uh, nervous about doing a first film in English uh, for all sorts of reasons. And then the next news is we're doing a film in five languages. And now like we, my, with my sound people, like we, um, sound engineer, like Claude Lae, like we were just counting recently that we have recorded dialogues in 17 languages. And, <laughs> and then, uh, and then well, I'm going for circle here because like in the end, like it's just like breaking cultural borders, I think what is what, it's a very important mission of artists. I think we should never uh, step, you know, stop in front of a uh, uh, what appears to be a separation between um, identities and nations. And and I think our role is to create bridges and and build bridges and 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 destroy borders. So and in that sense, of those seventeen languages, I have to add the one that doesn't need subtitles, the one that touches the heart the most directly, the one that needs no translation and can connect in every part of the world, and that's music. So I think cool. all all of it sort of like like this said like this seems to make sense. It's bound together. Um, it seems also that you know, Canada, in a way, I mean, with the francophone culture, you're you're in ties to Europe. You know the that experience. I mean, you're already sort of an international um, figure in a way, just by being Canadian. You're tied to all these different different worlds. You know, the English speaking part of Canada to to England, uh, the French speaking part to France. Um, did, did did you feel that at all? That you had more of a connection with European culture, uh, and that had an effect on the work you were doing, or did it feel more local to you? I, uh, well, you're strange, like one observation I make is that the actually like the uh, there's a sort of a cross, a cross relationship with the, the old countries where uh, my my friends like Atami Goyan and um, David Cronenberg, for instance, have like uh, are revered in France and uh, not in the same way in England. And I always felt more comfortable in London than in Paris. And that has to do with the, um, I guess, like uh, cultural colonialism that like we don't experience the same way, depending if you're on the English side or the French side of the country. And um, but what was to define, I think, my work even more so starting on Red Valley and I've discovered China and Asia. And then I started 
I think like I've actually sustained uh, uh, tighter ties with uh, China and, and Japan than with Europe. And um, I have uh, uh, grown projects in both countries and, and, and visited like numerous times Tokyo and Beijing and Shanghai and Hong Kong and and I've my fascination for uh for uh, Asia uh is a way to overcome a great lack we have in our education us like in the western world where we think that we've invented everything mathematics medicine um and and so on and like you know one day you step across that border to discover that there's a parallel world that was like has 5000 years of history and uh and then like i became i became fascinated with that and i think it enriched my my work and it enriched my life i'm i live with a korean uh woman uh and uh i keep keep growing projects in japan and china that, that feeling of sympathy or connection to that world is really evident and when we we watched the screening of the red violin the other night together and the the china set section is particularly moving and and just beautifully done and, and vivid so I, that seems like it's a clear um sort of connection that you've made to the to that part of the world um and i wondered you know with with your production of lohengrin that's playing now at the met through april 1st i should tell everyone um, it the birth of that project came through first producing the opera with the Bol Bolshoi Theater in Russia, and therefore you expanded even further your connection to different nations. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, that was like a, a remarkable and memorable in many different ways. I had had other like my Cirque du Soleil show Zarkana was played at the Kremlin Theater. And that was a very happy experience in my films I played in Russia and I did my number of trips to promote them. But um, this experience was like very intense. Uh, uh, first, because the Bolshoi is tr traditionally bound to uh, Western uh, or European uh, content um, to um, uh, Western music and composers and uh, sorry, no, to, bound to Russian repertoire and to Russian directors. And suddenly you have somebody in the name of Mr. Urin, who's uh, Vladimir Urin, who runs the Bolshoi, decided that he would open up to Western cultures and Western directors. So I said it uh, the opposite way. Uh, and I was like, clearly like, I was like the Met, first of all, had a series of, as you know better than me, had a series of three productions as part of this, opening program and i was uh granted the um opportunity to be one of those uh directors so like i, I was offered a co-production from the beginning it was peter and yannick and, and you like offered me to to do a co-production with the bolshoi on low and green which like i understood exactly the frame it was made very clear what i was to participate in the, and that was like incredible because uh that was like exactly as I said earlier, this was um, yet another border we were trying to push aside and open ways and bridges to uh, uh, between cultures. I think that's like, you know, something that uh, I, I cherish. And I think if I have to contribute to this world, that would be my humble little contribution as an artist. Then, uh, then came uh, various difficulties: the pandemic, uh, pandemic, and then like uh, uh, the Met lockdown, and and then uh, I arrived in Russia with Omicron, and then we were battling like a really difficult production because half the cast was sick all the time, and and we we had to separate the soloists from the chor choristers, and uh, as we were about to plant our flag and like just be like you know like. Uh, bring that to friction with uh, uh, uh and it was very intensive also very satisfying because we these experiences we bound us together like uh, with mr urin we would meet two three times a week to strategize against omicron and against and as we brought this home like the day we uh premiered low and green at the bolshoi coincided with the uh russian invasion of uh, ukraine on the same exact day 
and and then at first like you just like I was so I was numbed by it because I was already like in my own invasion of the Bolshoi with so many people on stage like so like there was no room to absorb the full extent of that event at that very particular moment um but it was very clear that night that the something very special was happening in the theater and that's something special is in retrospect after think like you know meditating on it for weeks and months uh writing about it even is that like in the room like we had like a uh, um, um, a fair amount of ukrainians sharing the like the seats with the russians same in the orchestra same in the chorus uh our elsa was ukrainian crying in my arms a few minutes before the curtain went up and because her mom and her sister were still in kiev and and suddenly there was the theater was invaded by this energy uh that i had to admit beyond my <laughs> vanity and uh egocentricity like was way beyond what we were doing there like we were just a vehicle of something way bigger than our artistic expression that night like the theater became the place where russians and ukrainians uh, uh manifested their opposition to war basically and uh, like there was a manifestation of solidarity among those people we happened to be part of them uh almost by accident but we were there and it was palpable that what was happening and it reminded me uh and and I actually like we all know what you know what what is our function what is the function of theater but more clearer than ever it was uh the theater was shown as the ex, ex as the ultimate meeting place for humans to make sense gather and make sense uh of the chaos we all live uh and and that has to be um we need to remember those moments because the you know like the too often i think art and theater and opera and film are seen from the entertainment of the few of the educated and the the but this these gatherings respond to uh, a fundamental need of the human race and we have to acknowledge that and i think it became my little mission in this big world we live in uh, became even clearer and i think it, it it already affects the choices i make for my 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 future well it's interesting that even though I imagine most of the Lohengrin production was conceived long before these cataclysmic world events. It somehow seems completely timely watching the production. And I should say to our viewers, you know, the production is a spectacular, stunning one dramatically and visually, but there is a sort of a sense uh, in the piece of a battling of worlds, a battling of an old way, um, clashing with a new way and who's going to win and who what where is the place for nobility and decency and and love um in this world uh that you've said in a sort of it has the feeling of a sort of bombed out post-apocalyptic landscape and uh it felt even more sitting and watching the production timely and to, to be speaking to where we are right now what is the world that we want and how are we going to come together and how will we work our way through these clashes between these opposing forces um so i can't i even imagine how you were generating this even before world events seem to give it an extra dimension yeah and then there was like yeah absolutely like it took a whole like different um perspective and read like and also put that in context that um Wagner was not played in, on the uh, historical stage of the um, uh the Bolshoi since 1963 Lohengrin since 1936 and mm. the the war that opposed uh, Germany and Russia has you know everything to do with it and mm. so there, there's deep wounds there that were like you know to play Wagner at the Bolshoi had that meaning to start with there's already a a fair amount of war um collateral damage um and 
and then and then and then like you like the the opera opens with uh, the herald saying, "Hey, the king is arriving." King comes, and the third line he sings is like he says, "Babanchans, I came to recruit you. Let's go beat the Hungarians." Like he, he's actually going to war, and he may, he's making a stop in Babantia to recruit the Babanchans. He needs more men, and like and then. Uh, they will never go to war because that was only the pretext to bring these forces together. And then there's a, a little intrigue that we're going to take four hours and a half to uh, <laughs> to, to resolve. But uh, but he, it's like the first thing that the King Enrich says at the opening of the opera is like, let's go to war. And that it was said on the stage, the historical stage of the Bolshoi, the day that Russia invaded Ukraine. So you know, like you just sit in there and say, my God, like, am I, do I understand what's happening or not? And probably we don't like, you know, the, these coincidences carry so much. And uh, we're just like at the uh, crossroad of, of very uh, big currents, much bigger than, than any individual can, um, you know, understand. Did, did, did anything in, in the way that you handled the production in New York after doing it at the Bolshoi change, given all of what you just said? No, but uh, I wouldn't say directly like that because the production was conceived. So like we, we didn't change the concept or the, uh, but what changes my commitment to the stage, to this event? Um, more than ever, I was grateful to be sitting among 3,900 people uh, and having something to do with the experience of that day, the energy in the room. This is extraordinary. This is 3,900 New Yorkers who put their phones aside, their jobs, their whatever they have in their life, their busy life. God knows New York is busy and gather for four hours and a half. And and then for you and me to be a part of this, to be facilitator of that, I mean, for me, that's what changed. It's like that mission of ours became clearer. My commitment became more militant and, and, and more than ever. And also like the add to that, that there's been a lot of this discussions about uh, live and Zoom performances and this and that. The theater is our modern chapel. This is where this is where we can together elevate ourselves into some kind of a smarter meditation. And mm. I'm not saying smarter in the sense of elite. This is the time humans need to try to figure out traffic, chaos, uh, anarchy. Uh, and, and God knows, like, we're, this is our life. Like, you know, that we're surrounded. There's a moment where we can stop together and, and, and uh, hold hands. Mm. I've talked to several people who said that even though the opera is, you know, it's it's a fairly long opera, um, but that they felt like the time just disappeared because you enter this world that you've created so vividly and so beautifully. And because we we need more than ever a space to be together and to experiencing experience things communally and to sort of meditate on these big questions uh, that the, that the opera addresses and that we're all facing in life today. Um, I found that several people have commented on that, that that they just enter that world and they go through this experience and they're they're really immersed in it fully. I, uh, Paul, like you, uh, you will remember how I mean, this is something I, I uh, am fully aware and I'm working like consciously working on that because uh, well, the first Wagner uh, opera I directed was um, Siegfried. Uh, there's uh, three hours, forty-five minutes of music in Siegfried, and then, and then the next one is uh, Parsifal, and that is five hours of music, and now this one. So, and right from Siegfried, that was a, by far the longest piece I had to dealt with, and I was very conscious of needing to reshape the clock, like to try to to to, to remodulate time. And uh, when I came to Parsifal, I think that was like, you know, my experience with Siegfried was very uh, informative and helped me a great deal. Uh, like 
with like and in here again i think if you remember the overture of parsifal and this overture first thing you do is say okay now we're going to watch a moon for a minute 45 seconds cross the frame and the next one will be a little faster and the next one will be a little faster so we enter into a mantric contemplation of time and the next thing you know like you've done 15 minutes of the opera in one gesture and everybody's like reset their clock and and then there's a factor i think we have staging uh uh st directing in general staging is like you know we're in a time manipulation this is we're in a time sculpture and i've grown very fond of that aspect of thing i think this is one place where i think we can make the biggest impact is by um by reshaping the time frame and that i think is a very important aspect especially in the long and a long opera like low and green and and uh, uh there's like i've develop my little techniques to do that. But I think this is what, you know, one big important aspect. Well, that's an especially important gift for uh, audience members in a Wagner opera, especially today when our sense of time has really been sped up by social media and film editing and all those things. So uh, it's a really singular achievement to be able to get us into a completely separate uh, framework of time and a sense of time that allows us to receive the music and the pacing that Wagner has created or to, you know, that's organic to the piece. Um, and I, and your use of film projections is a great, it's just interesting given your film background that this is a, a world where you, your film manipulates time it, it, by, through editing and camera work and, and you are able to call on your film expertise as well as your staging abilities to, to make those two things come together to create this different world with its own sense of time. Yeah, like the, um, well, one thing I say, like my, this time discourse that I give you now, like, you know, you develop over the years, but I, like, I can tell you that it was shaped, originally shaped by a, a negative experience. I once uh, went to see a uh, Siegfried production as I was preparing my own Siegfried and the, um, creators of that Siegfried, I thought, uh, had filled it with a, a great number of small actions in fear of it being boring. And as a result, it made it feel like, like, like 10 times longer because it's the, I, I like, I was, uh, I, that was a, a negative experience that became very positive because it became so clear to me that's the opposite you need to do. Like uh, you need to simplify, slow the time, not accelerate it. You need to, like the videos you're talking about, the Peter Flaherty's monumental, beautiful frescoes are extremely slow, all of them. Like it moves so slow all the time. But then by the time a moon had passed or a cloud has moved or a new element transition is complete, you got 10 minutes, 15 minutes checked. And then because so, and then I often invite the singers to commit to their position and not be afraid of stillness and not be afraid of staying there 10 minutes and singing. And they all want to move. But like if you manage to like uh, hold, embrace the length, in simple gestures and not fill it with unnecessary little forms, time is compressed and things appear much uh, shorter. And I mean, that's, you know, like a, my little time theory on stage. Oh, it's fascinating. We as audience members really absorb that and take it in and, and are changed by it. I mean, that's a remarkable thing that that transformation that occurs and a transformation in in a perception of the world and of time. And then I'm, I'm curious how this experience then had what did it have any effect on as you move to your next project, The Hunting Gun, uh, directing a play and on a very small scale compared to the huge scale of the Metropolitan Opera stage with a chorus of 130 whatever people and a giant orchestra and you know, cast and actors and dancers. What was it like to to shift to a completely different scale? Well, well, like I mean, like uh, uh, quite some time ago, like I did my first one man show in two thousand one, I think, 
and there was uh, Alessandro Barricos Novecento. And uh, I've grown super fond of the small form uh, as a uh, complement to the bigger form, uh, like bigger form being those operas I've done with you in the Met and uh, uh, or Cirque du Soleil shows or like larger movies uh, where you like you have uh, the the you're granted the privilege of large cast and special effects or like like you have large cost like you know like a big de de deployment of of uh, resources and i found extremely um, healthy to go back to the essential to go back to the small form where you're deprived of all uh, all protections where you're suddenly naked in the middle of uh, an empty space and uh, work with only the essential something to be said somebody to say it and someone to listen and what's missing you actually like work from the completely opposite uh, uh, starting point and I, I've, I've this is how I grew really fond of the extremes the middle that I'm trying to avoid but I'm I keep bouncing back from one to the other and I've done four uh, one man one woman shows and hunting gun is one of them and um and did but the particularity is that this time i the the rehearsals even overlapped like you know in the week prior to the premiere of uh, uh during the orchestra rehearsal premiere of low and green at the met when we get in orchestra rehearsals there's day off because they like you know you can't have the chorus in the orchestra every day so you have an orchestra rehearsal a day off and there, and I would interlace them with my rehearsals on the other side with me, me, uh, Mikhail uh, Barishnikov and Miki Nakatani for Hunting Gone in the same week. And now, like they're playing at the same time. On Saturday, I saw both in full length. And yesterday, I saw Hunting Gone and I went for, to catch the third act of Low and Green. And they are completely uh, opposite uh, forms. And uh, to me, like, uh, I, I, you know, for me, it gives me. Um, I think one informs the other, and um, and I have to say that the difficulty. I, I think that Yannick uh, Yannick Nezesege would feel the same. Like Yannick recorded a solo piano, he's not even established or like renowned for his piano playing. During the pandemic, he went out and recorded a, a solo piano. How courageous is that? Because when he's at the Met and it's like yesterday night, he has a hundred musicians. And he's got, he's like a warrior with a big, thick armor. Uh, and then he's got 130 choristers and the best chorus masters in the world. Like he's surrounded with so much resources that, uh, you know, uh, he's got lots of credit for what we hear, but he's protected also. And then suddenly he's alone at the piano. And that, I think, for me, like, I'm listening to his piano uh, uh, album. I hear Brahms, I hear Bach, and it's almost like I hear an orchestra and a chorus. Uh -huh. He goes find the DNA of his large gesture in the small gestures, and I think that's super healthy. Yannick is a a, 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 a musician, period, and then I think he, he feels the need to, to go back to the small form once in a while. That makes sense, and uh, what a great study and contrast and, and their effect on each other. Um, I'm afraid we have to wrap up our conversation, but it's been great to talk with you as always. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing The Hunting Gun now that Lone Grin is open and uh, running so successfully. And uh, we'll look forward to the next project and our next conversation. Hunting Gun at the Barish Nikov Arts Center until like uh, April 15 with the Grand Master Barishnikov was like a, a light in now in my life, and uh, Miki Naketani, the Japanese star, was like remarkable and and uh, like they're really worth the uh, coming and see. Paul, it's always a pleasure. Like, uh, and let's continue this conversation. We'll do. Take care. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks.